Today's episode, episode four, is about my secret weapon for the most powerful resonance and the most reliable support. My secret weapon, and I call it a secret weapon because I kind of think it is a secret because nobody ever really told me about it in such concrete terms. So I'm going to really break it down for you because it is a secret weapon because once you know it, it really does kind of globally change how you use your body to make sound. And by the way, if you know anyone else who you think should really hear this, tag them. Tag them and say, listen, watch later, because this is good stuff, you guys. All right, secret weapon. What is it? I'm just go right for it. The secret weapon is opposition. So it's a concept, right? You were probably thinking I'm gonna show you a scale or I'm gonna show you something. Mm -mm. It's a concept. Opposition. What does it mean? How do we use it? What does it do, right? Understanding this changes the way you use your body. And when we do that, then we have a really big way to affect stability and reduce or eliminate tension and strain altogether, which I know is something that a lot of singers struggle with, tension and strain. So how do we use opposition? Today I'm gonna to give you four concrete examples of how you can use opposition in your singing to start to affect some change. So first one, let's talk about this. I want you to think, breathe out when you breathe in. So that's probably like, what? How can I take air in if I'm breathing out? Again, these are conceptual things, you guys. Most of you, when you breathe in, you take all of the muscles and girth of your body and you actually pull it in. And you take this breath. And I hate the phrase, take a breath, because it implies, did you see what my hand did when I did the gesture and I took? I closed, I constricted, I contracted, I took in my energy as opposed to expanding, okay? When we breathe, we wanna expand, okay? So instead of thinking, breathe in when you inhale, and then you're gonna take all the energy of your body and your neck and your ribs, and you're gonna pull it in and up towards your larynx, which then creates tension. I want you to think, breathe out. Okay? So it's a directional thing. It means that you're going to take your ribs and the muscles of your back and the support of that you would usually use to support. When you breathe, you got to let all this go. And what I want you to do is let it go and expand. Okay? So you're creating this big, beautiful container on your breath because you're letting the breath expand you out. Okay? So do you guys relate to any of you feel that when you breathe in, you actually breathe in? Does that happen to you? I used to do that when I was a singer coming up and I didn't understand these things. <laughs> and now when I think inhale, I think breathe out so that I expand and I get into my back and I release my belly. How this works is we want to expand the muscles in between the ribs. These are called the intercostal muscles. It's the muscles like if you eat spare ribs, <laughs> those are, that's what we're eating when we eat spare ribs, okay? We want to let those muscles go and we want to release and expand them so that the ribs get nice and wide to make room for the lungs that are expanding, filling with air. Your only job on the inhale is to create space. You don't have to pull the air into your body. There's all kinds of laws of physics that support this. Law of equilibrium. When the air pressure inside your lungs is different than the air pressure outside your body, the gas wants to equalize. So you don't have to actually pull air into your body. You just gotta make room, okay? So give yourself some space. Breathe out as you breathe in. So this is a key opposition idea. Don't think breathe in, because then you're gonna take all your energy and all your, uh, your girth and everything and you're gonna contract it inwards, which we don't want. So, first opposition concept, breathe out when you breathe in. And what this does is it reduces tension because you are releasing on the inhale and you're also not starting the phrase from a place of tension, because when you breathe in to inhale and you go, like, did you see what my body did? And like all of the energy and all of the, the muscles here contracted up and in towards my larynx. So now my larynx has a lot of pressure on it before I've even sung a note. 
And so we're starting from a place of tension. It's really hard to release that once you've started there. So how about this? Don't even start there. Breathe out to breathe in, okay? All right, so that's the first one. Okay, number two, idea of opposition. Inhale when you exhale. So I know I'm like totally messing with you here. I'm telling you to breathe out when you breathe in. I'm telling you to exhale when you inhale and inhale when you exhale. You'll, it will all sort of iron out in your mind. So when we're inhaling, like we were just talking about, we want to expand, okay? When we go to make sound, when we go to exhale our air to vibrate, we want to feel like we are continuing to inhale. So for those of you who are members of my um, virtual voice studio, which by the way, if you're not, it's free. You should totally join. It's full of tips and tools and all kinds of things I send you guys. I wrote about this about two weeks ago um, in the um, newsletter that I sent you. This idea of singing on the gesture of the inhale. So this is an idea of opposition. You're moving air out, but you gotta feel like you're drawing it in and you're continuing to feel this feeling of inhale as you exhale. Why does this work and how does this work? Because again, what most singers do when they are unaware is they feel like they need to push a lot of air out and move a lot of air out in order to make sound. And the truth of the matter is you guys, and I say this over and over again, you do not need a lot of air to sing. In fact, you need very little. You need a very focused, steady stream that is very narrow stream, okay? If you're blasting yourself with a lot of air, your chords cannot vibrate uh, consistently. They're getting blasted. It's like a flag in a hurricane. I think I gave that example at one point, right? Versus a flag in a gentle breeze, you get this nice oscillation. So, the idea of singing on the gesture of inhalation, what is the gesture of inhalation? Yes, exhale air is moving out when you sing, but when you sing on the gesture of inhalation, what you're doing is you're keeping expansion because that is the gesture of inhalation as we just talked about in opposition example number one, which is breathe out to breathe in, right? So you've expanded on the inhale beautifully, now you need to stay expanded. You need to sing as though you feel your body is continuing to inhale and feel that consistency there. Because if not, then you do a few things. You end up either actively pushing your ribs in or collapsing your ribs. Either way, they have the same effect, which is the heavy bones of the ribs push air out of lungs and your diaphragm sits at the very base of your rib cage and the ribs kind of are around it. When the ribs fold in, what happens to this diaphragm? It gets shoved up and then that pushes more air out of your lungs. So you've got air being pushed out from all directions. So you're being blasted with too much air. You feel out of breath before you want to be. The sound is airy and odds are you're creating a lot of tension doing so because if you've got so much air moving out, the body doesn't like that sensation and you don't like how it sounds. And so you go in and you tense in your neck and your throat and your jaw to create basically a dam to prevent all that air from blasting out. And so you feel tension and strain. Do any of you experience this? Do any of you notice that like when you go for a longer phrase or a higher note, you just feel so much tension here? Odds are it's because you're not continuing to sing on the gesture of inhalation. Okay, so I'm gonna out myself right now. I totally used to do that when I was a younger singer. Any of you? It's okay, I won't tell anybody. <gasps> um, but that's, that's how we improve. When we admit that we have things that maybe don't feel so good to us, we gotta notice it because that's the body telling you that you're probably not doing it efficiently. So we've got the first two ideas of opposition. Breathe out to breathe in, inhale feeling when you exhale, sing on the gesture of inhalation because then you definitely get rid of a lot of that tension that's caused by everything pushing out, okay? Now what's number three? This one is, this one is so key. Think down to go up. So what does this mean? When pitch rises, the energy of our support needs to descend. 
So just like we've been talking about, when the energy of the body moves up towards the larynx, that's when tension is created and when too much air is forced out. So most of us tend to do that most often on a pitch rise or on the high notes at the, you know, in a phrase. And we feel like pitch is up here, like high note is up here and low note is down here. But the problem, you guys, is that like pitch doesn't exist in physical space. Those of you who know me, I'm, I'm, I say this all the time, right? Up is not up here. Down is not down here, okay? We exist in physical space. So, you know, for us, because of gravity, our entire existence is up is here, down is here, and up takes effort because of gravity, right? You're gonna climb a mountain, you're gonna go upstairs. It takes effort to go up because of gravity. Doesn't take effort to go down. You, you wanna go down, you could just slide. You could let go of the rope and fall, right? And we take this sensory experience into our singing and we treat pitch the same way. And that gets us into trouble because most of us, when we have a note that rises, we effort and we take all this that we just worked so hard to expand and we then push to get ourselves up there. But the problem is up there is not up there. It's not, it's, it's all here. <laughs> Abraham Lincoln said all notes created equal, right? So, but we forget that. We forget that notes don't exist in physical space. So we start to do things to effort and to push towards a high note. And those are the very things that make the high note come out not the way we want. So what do we do? We bring in this idea of opposition. We think down to go up, okay? So if I'm uh, gonna sing a scale and I'm gonna go up to the top of the scale and I'm gonna hold the scale, what I wanna do is I wanna engage my lower core abdominal muscles and my pelvic floor. Now, pelvic floor is your friend. Does anybody not know what pelvic floor is or how to use it when you sing? Because this is like, Oh, this is the good stuff. All right, pelvic floor. It is otherwise known as perineum. It's between your legs. Both men and women have it. It's the muscle between your hmm and your hmm. No, do I don't need to be graphic? We get this. <laughs> um, sometimes it's called the taint, okay? It's the muscle between where you urinate and where you poop, okay? Um, it's really, essential to understand how to use this because you can employ pelvic floor to help you with opposition, with this idea of down to go up. So to find your pelvic floor, stand up. Uh, if you, you know that feeling like if you're having to urinate, you have to pee and there's no bathroom in sight and you just have to hold it for a little while till you can find a bathroom. So you draw your pelvic floor up towards your belly button to, to hold so that you don't pee, right? that's drawing the pelvic floor upwards. Now release it, let it go, just be neutral. Now go in the opposite direction. Bear down on your pelvic floor as though you were having a bowel movement or if, if you're a woman, if you've given birth, if, if you were pushing a baby out, it, those are, that's bearing down on your pelvic floor. Okay, so now let it come back to neutral. So it's not something anybody can see from the outside. I, I wouldn't be able to see it. It's something that you feel on the inside. Um, we do not want to draw our pelvic floor up towards our belly button for singing, but bearing down on it in the opposite direction can be really helpful. So if you sat back down, stand up again, put your hands on your obliques, so right above, right above your hip bones, keep your hands here, and then I want you to bear down on your pelvic floor as though you were pooping, or if you were constipated and you were trying to, you know, have, have a bowel movement, bear down. Do you feel the energy? Do you feel the muscles under your hands here in your abdomen engage and activate? You probably do and you should. And because when you activate and engage your pelvic floor down, it engages all those core low internal abdominal muscles. And those are the muscles that we need for support when we sing because those are the muscles that help stabilize the diaphragm to stay low and move slow so that the diaphragm isn't popping up too quickly and pushing a lot of air out of your lungs before you want it to. Do my abs contract when engaging the pelvic floor? They will activate, but they will not pull inwards. They will, if anything, flex outwards and down. So if you're having trouble feeling this and you want a little bit more sensation, keep your hands on your obliques and like really, really bear down. Like you're really having trouble going to the bathroom and you go, you know, I mean, we don't want to do that when we sing, but 
Try it. When you do that, you're gonna feel those muscles go probably, likely. So there's a difference between flex and contract. So generally, when you bear down in your pelvic floor, you do feel all these lower muscles kind of flex towards your hands as you do that. So on a scale of one to 10, when we are constipated or if you're giving birth, um, that is a 10 in terms of really bearing down on the pelvic floor. And we don't want a 10 when we sing. We want like a four or five or a six at max, okay? Because when you super bear down like a 10, if you'll notice like all these other muscles get involved. If I bear down like a 10, like you see, right? We don't want that. So it's about isolation. It's about being able to engage these and gently lower the pelvic floor slowly and gradually up to about a six when you need it. So here's how this works. You felt all those muscles engage when you bear down on your pelvic floor and all of those muscles gently descending with the pelvic floor and activating, like I said before, are what keep your diaphragm stabilized. So as you rise in pitch, especially the higher up in your range you go, I shouldn't say that, I should say the higher up in each register you go. So when you're reaching top of chest voice as well as top of head voice, it's not just about only singing in the stratosphere, it's about reaching the top of each register, you, the higher you go, the more you want to lower and descend these muscles because it's when they come up with the pitch that you get in trouble. So uh, I'm gonna see if I can do an example, like a, like a bad example and then a good example so you can hear the difference. If I don't engage pelvic floor or think down to go up when I rise in pitch, and this one I'm gonna do in chest voice first, it'll, most likely sound squeezed and not very comfortable and it'll probably hurt me. It's probably not gonna feel good. So I'm gonna to try to give you the, the negative example. Ma! Like it doesn't feel good to me and it probably doesn't sound good to you. It doesn't sound very good to me either. But when I activate this opposition technique, right? Cause what I just did was thinking up to go up. Ma! I mean, you can see like everything in my body goes this way, you know? But when I think down to go up, when I gently lower my pelvic floor, like you wanna think of it like an elevator. So it's like, this is your elevator column, right? Going all the way down and it starts at the top floor and it goes all the way down through, down to the first floor, down to the basement, down to the pelvic floor. Yes, I just made that joke. <laughs> Sorry, I'm a mom. I make mom jokes, you guys. It goes all the way down to the pelvic floor and then it's got to stay there until the end of the phrase. So just because you reach the top note doesn't mean that you then let go of this low descending support. You gotta keep it going through the end of the phrase. So I'm gonna go up the scale and I'm gonna go back down the scale and I'm gonna employ pelvic floor. I'm gonna think down to go up. I'm gonna even use my hand and I'm gonna gesture down as I go up so that you can see how this works. So down to go up. I'm gonna go, Ma. I'm descending with my support. And I can do the same thing if I'm in my head voice. Ma. Now say I wanna hold that high note, okay? I'm gonna show you what, with my hand, what I'm doing with my pelvic floor. So I'm gonna guide my pelvic floor with my hand right now. Did you notice how when I got to the top note, I didn't stop. My hand didn't stop. My pelvic floor, my energy down here did not can stop descending. I continued descending until I reached the end of the phrase. So what is super important about this idea of opposition, if you're gonna employ this, you gotta know where the apex of your uh, support your, your floor is because if you get to the, to the bottom of your, of your pelvic floor before the end of your phrase, then you're stuck because you got nowhere else to go yet. You're not, you're not done with the phrase. So it's about gradually getting into that and maintaining it over the course of the phrase. All right. So that's down to go up. And what it does is it redirects the energy of your support and your sound away from the direction of the rising pitch so that you don't get stuck in your throat because going the other way, that's what creates tension and strain and gives us the feeling and the sound that we don't like. 
Number four, last idea of opposition. So first three, we've got breathe out to breathe in. We've got inhale to exhale, and we've got down to go up. Last idea of opposition, up to go down. When I'm talking about up to go down, I'm talking about soft palate space, pulling and rising, even though pitch descends. So I know a lot of you probably understand the idea of space and getting into this hooked up high soft palate space, this very ears widening high between your ears, smiley soft palate space when pitch rises. But um, the thing that we forget is that even on the lower pitches and even on descending pitches, we need to continue to pull up on this. So to, to feel soft palate and to feel this lift, the first way I was taught is it's a feeling of your ears widening away from each other. And an easy way you can feel that, um, and I think some of you may have heard me say this before, it's like if somebody put a plate of brownies under your nose, hot out the oven, and they smell really good, smell the brownies. When you smell, when you breathe into a nose breath, into a smile, and you really can feel all of that kind of space shoot up back there in your soft palate, that's, that's the, the idea. That's how you kind of feel your soft palate stretch when your ears widen. You can also have a feeling of your molars riding into your brain and kind of tilting up. You can, you can feel that like you're gonna bite an apple or something, you gotta bite like with your back molars like a carrot and so you gotta make room for it and you go like, ah, cause you gotta fit something big inside your mouth, okay? So those are all kind of tips to, to find space in your soft palate. Once you have found the space though, you gotta keep it guys. That's, that's the trick with this. Up to go down, pull up on your soft palate. So, most um, resonance issues like nasal resonance, uh, being flat in pitch, a dull kind of not so round and colorful resonance, all of those are caused by a soft palate that has fallen or that's not even fallen but that was never activated in the first place. Um, because if you are in that space, you're giving the sound more room to bounce around and you are affecting the shape of the inside of your resonating cavity. And the shape of a space is what determines how a sound resonates. If you think of a, a dome-shaped room, you're gonna get an echo. If it's like a short squat room, it's a really dead room because the shape is what's creating that. So we can change the shape of the inside of our mouth by how we pull and manipulate on the soft palate. So, um, what I want you to do is breathe into that space between your ears, smell the brownies, breathe, use a nose breath at first because it's easier to find it. Breathe into the space between your ears, smell the brownies, and then you're just gonna siren on a yaw. And as you siren down on the yaw, do not let that ears widening fall. Do not let that feeling of joy between your cheeks and height in your molars descend. Continue to pull up. So try it, nose breath and then yaw. Yaw! I go down the scale. You notice how I'm continuing this feeling of expanding back. It's like the back of my skull is exploding like the Hollywood Bowl back there, all right? Um, doing descending scales or descending arpeggios or whatever is really great for finding this uh, because as you go down, you just want to maintain that sensation of open space. So, and it's the same thing if you do it in your chest voice, same thing. Yeah! Like, I do not want to go, yeah! You hear how it like dulls? Or it might even become nasal. Yeah! Oh, I sound French when I do that. So, pull up anytime pitch descends or when you're in the lower part of a phrase. Don't just like sit on it because it's low and it's easy because you can get away with it. It doesn't mean it sounds good, right? Um, and the reason this creates stability is because you then can, you're, you're creating a shape that then you can move within for vowels and consonants. So what I mean by that is once you get into this shape and you understand what this is and it feels stable to you, the idea is to be able to move the tongue and the lips and, and, and to not have that shape compromised. I have an exercise that I do with my students that I call dumb jaw 
but really it's an exercise in keeping your soft palate lifted because if you're grabbing in your jaw, that keeps the soft palate, um, it keeps the soft palate kind of locked in a downward position because the muscles inside your cheeks connect up to your soft palate. So if you're holding in your jaw, then you're holding your soft palate. So if the jaw is soft, soft doesn't mean open. It doesn't have to be, right? Because that's, it just means not grabbing. Keep your jaw soft and then your soft, and then your soft palate will be able to stretch big. So I do this exercise called dumb jaw, which is basically an exercise in keeping shape even though tongue is moving. So you're gonna find your ears and you're gonna find your smile and you're just gonna go, ah, yeah, 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 yeah. You wanna be able to move your tongue upside up and down without your jaw flapping and without your soft palate descending every time your jaw goes back and forth. So do it slowly. Ay, 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 ay. Every time you open into that ah, restate that feeling of shape back there. And you can do it in head voice too. Ay, 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 ay. So then you can go in a scale. Ay, 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 ay. And not have the nasal sound, which would be the difference you've got the nasal sound and then my jaw grabbing and then when I release my jaw I'm able to get into my space between my ears so everything is opposition you guys it's just so easy once you grasp the concept you breathe out when you want to breathe in you think Inhale when you want to exhale for sound. You think down to go up. You think up to go down. And what this does is it creates global stability. All right, it's like everything is moving opposite in opposition to each other. Everything is moving away from the midline. So if you think about the midline being like right here, right, larynx and heart space, we want to ultimately unencumber the larynx because it's when the larynx becomes encumbered either by soft palate squashing down, jaw tensing and pushing, or tongue tensing and pushing, ribs and diaphragm pushing in and up, muscles of support going in and up, everything in that sense then moves you towards your larynx, which then becomes encumbered with strain and tension. And that's when singing doesn't feel good and singing doesn't sound good. So all of these ideas of opposition are to get you to move away from the midline. And, and you're moving your resonance and your support in opposite directions, okay? That's the key. Resonance goes up and out, support goes down and out. You need to move them away from each other. The example that I love to give my students is this example of how do you stabilize a sailboat in choppy water? What do you do? You raise the sail and you drop the anchor and whoo, that boat is not going anywhere, okay? This, this soft pellet, this is your sail. All of this down here, the support, your pelvic floor, that's your anchor. Drop your anchor away from the direction of your sail. Pull your sail away from your anchor, and then you've got stability. And then your cords can vibrate freely and beautifully. You'll be able to get the sound that you are meant to make. Woo, that was a lot of information. <laughs> But seriously, with stability, then you get to sing the things that you want to sing without strain and tension. It's just, it's just so much better. I mean, we're all in this because we love to sing and it really sucks when it doesn't feel good. So that's the whole point of all this is so that it can feel as good as it sounds. If you guys are interested in, in working with me, I do give online lessons um, and my intensive is now available online in the sense that you do not have to be in LA to do it. Um, you know, let me know if this is something you're interested in. We can talk, uh, even if you're not in LA, it's, it's totally possible now that we have all this technology. Come visit me on my website, ardenkwinvocalstudio.com. And while you're there, be sure to sign up for email updates to become a member of my virtual voice studio. You'll get instant access to a powerful video training called Be a More Consistent Singer and you'll get first dibs on singing workshops and master classes, as well as access to studio member only tips, tools, and insights I don't share anywhere else. And forward on to your friends, don't be a stingy singer, right? Just because you know these things, don't be that singer who's like, ooh, I'm not gonna tell anybody else so that I get to be the best singer and they can suck, right? 
forward, forward it on. A rising tide lifts all boats. It's been so awesome to engage with you today and I look forward to doing it again next month. Bye-bye.